and just take your Bible. Please turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to continue looking at our subject that we began on Wednesday evening of the assurance of salvation. Now, unfortunately, today in the church, many believers lack the assurance of salvation. You say to me, Pastor, what's assurance? The assurance of salvation is this. It is the confident expectation that I have. It is that confident knowledge that leads me to know that I am saved right this minute and that heaven is going to be my home. That's assurance. It's knowing that I am saved right now and that heaven is my what? Home. It's that full confidence that I know my sins are forgiven, I've received eternal life, and I'm going to spend eternity with God and His kingdom. That's assurance. There are a lot of believers today who are being robbed of their assurance because there are a lot of false gospels being preached. And they are another gospel, and they are what Paul calls a perversion of the gospel and the anathema of God is upon them. But, unfortunately, there are many big-name preachers, Christian celebrities, who are promoting these false gospels, okay? And they sell a lot of books, they hold a lot of conferences, they have big mega churches, and they have a lot of influence on Christians who are just sheep who need to be instructed and what? Taught. And the Bible tells us clearly, in the last days, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, that they'd have a form of godliness. They'd still gather, they'd still carry a Bible, they'd still quote the Bible and use the name of Jesus, but it's another Jesus and another gospel, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What's the power of the, of the church? It is the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who what? believe and yet today the simple gospel of the grace of God that Christ has done everything and finished the work and that all is left for sinners to do is simply believe upon him and trust him as their savior is being what taken away and being replaced with another gospel that says believe in Christ plus do something what else are you with me now and folks listen as you go out there into the world you realize you represent Jesus Christ and we're told to give an account to everyone who asks of us of the faith that lies in us. This is a fundamental foundational principle. And if we're wrong on this, we're going to be wrong on the rest of the Christian life. I can't tell you how many Christians I know, people who are saved, who, who lack the assurance that they are saved. They've trusted Christ, been born again, loved the Lord, and yet in their heart they still feel that they're not good enough to get into heaven because they've been preached a false gospel that tells them that somehow it depends on something they do rather than the finished work of Jesus Christ. Are you with me here? And they don't understand the principle of grace. They sing amazing grace, but they have no clue what grace means. Are you with me tonight? And you're called to represent Christ, so you better be able to make sure that when you share the gospel with people, you don't raise false issues. The issue when you're sharing the gospel and you're witnessing to people is faith alone in Christ alone, okay, period. The, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he rose again, he ascended back into heaven, and that all who simply what? Believe will be forgiven and receive eternal life and saved. All those other issues of the Christian life, how you live, etc., spiritual growth, that's comes after salvation. It has nothing to do with salvation. You've got to rightly divide the word and keep, you have to keep salvation separate from what? Experiential sanctification. You have to keep justification, all right, or salvation separate from discipleship and spiritual growth. They're two different things. You understand what we're talking about here? Works have to do with what? Growth and reward. Salvation has to do with pure grace through simple faith, all right? And you can't mingle them. Now, Unfortunately, the people who promote these false gospels also quote the scriptures. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, look at verse 15. In account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Jesus hasn't come back because he's given men a chance to be what? Saved. 
Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in his epistles, speaking in them of those things in which are, are some things hard to be what? Understood. And of course, you have to realize Peter's a Jew writing to Jews who are dispersed throughout the world. And they've heard Paul and they've read, it, read some of Paul's what? Letters. And Paul's talking about the mystery and the church and the grace of God. And they come from what? The ritualist, ritualistic, legalistic religion of Judaism. And it's a little hard for them to grasp. Okay? that salvation is this free gift and all the mystery that mystery doctrine that pertains to this age of the church which is revealed through who Paul and his epistles okay and it says which they that are unlearned and unstable rest to rest means to twist okay to distort to change to pervert you get that they rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own what destruction there are so many christians today m across this nation and across the world who are followers of what's called lordship salvation which is part of uh, calvinism and calvinism of course the belief that god has predestined certain ones to heaven other ones to hell and the only no way you can know that if you are one of the ones predestined to heaven is if you persevere in a holy life and that leads people to introspection and constantly looking at their works to see if they've done enough to prove that they're one of the elect and if they're saved it is another gospel it is a false gospel there are big names like John MacArthur and John Piper and Paul Washer and I can list many many other names R.C. Sproul's another one and down the line these men are preaching another gospel they have apostatized they're mixing works with grace. They are preaching a work salvation. Look at verse 17. It warns us about those who twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They're leaving so many people frustrated under bondage and fear and guilt instead of living in the love and the joy and the freedom that there is in grace in Christ. Do you understand? Look at verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved... Seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Listen, just because you're in the grace of God today doesn't mean that you will what? Always remain from in the grace of God. And you say, what does that mean, Pastor? I thought once you're saved, you're always saved. Yeah, once you're saved, you're always saved. You're in the grace of God positionally, and you can never lose that. But experientially, does that mean that you will walk in the grace of God always? No. You could be like the Galatians and fall back into what? Legalism. Some preacher that you might get impressed with, or some group of Christians could bully you and intimidate you, and now they put you under their legalistic system of the spiritual life or of salvation and you could fall from your own steadfastness that's why it's so important to understand the grace of God and that's where verse 18 comes in it says but grow in what grace, grace. you get the picture you got to grow in grace the only way you can grow is in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be glory both now and forever amen turn to me the second Corinthians chapter 13 now this is an important study. This is a fundamental doctrine of our faith. If we're wrong here, we're going to be wrong everywhere else. The Christian life begins with salvation by what? Grace. Right? That's where it all begins, at the foot of the cross, where sin has come to receive the grace of God. And how, how salvation is given to men is absolutely important. Roman Catholic Church says, take some sacraments, confess your sins, uh, take the wafer, Follow the traditions of the church, and then maybe when you die, you'll go to purgatory. And if you suffer long enough in purgatory, maybe someday God will let you into heaven. That's another gospel. That's paganism. That's a false gospel. And yet Protestants have adopted a, a softer version of Catholicism. They throw out the purgatory and the sacraments, but they keep the works. Okay, let me give you an example of what's being taught now. John Piper has written this about what salvation is and he's a big name uh, John MacArthur is kind of the grand the, the granddaddy of this Lordship Salvation movement and Pipe is the like the rock star right now who everybody looks up to and can't wait for his next book to be printed and here's what he says about saving faith these are just some of the conditions that the New Testament says we must meet in order to be saved in the fullest and final sense we must believe in Jesus and receive him 
and turn from our sin and obey him and humble ourselves like little children and love him more than we love our family, our possessions, or our own life. This is what it means to be converted to Christ and this alone is the way of everlasting life. And let me tell you, did you get that? He added about seven more conditions, which are what? Human what? Works to the simple gospel. Paul was asked in the book of Acts, chapter 16, 30 to 31, by the Philippian jailer, right out, as clear as the nose on your face. Sirs, what must I do to what? Be saved. And he was told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Period. Period. You see, so what we have here, John Piper's got a big church, a big ministry, speaks at a lot of conferences, has a lot of influence over millions of Christians, but he is an apostate. He is preaching another gospel. He may have done good things in the past, but listen, he is now leading people astray because if you follow that plan of salvation, okay, you will wind up in what? Hell. Obeying Christ and following Christ and giving up your possessions and loving God more than your family, that's part of what? Discipleship, but that has nothing to do with being what? Saved. You get the picture? It's another gospel. Then there's the other fellow, MacArthur. Okay? John MacArthur. And listen to some of the things he said. And this is nothing more than a counterfeit gospel. And Satan loves to what? Take that which is what? the truth, right? And then replace it with his counterfeit that looks a lot and sounds a lot like the what? Truth. That's why the Bible says there's another gospel and another Jesus. But it's not the true gospel and the true Jesus. And we've been warned to be led away from the simplicity that is in who? Christ. Away from the simple gospel message of the grace of God received by faith alone in Christ alone. MacArthur says this, he defines faith he says, faith consists of a firm conviction. Pretty good right there. But then he says, and a personal surrender. And conduct and behavior inspired by the surrender. Now, do you get that? He went from a firm conviction, which is faith, to adding what? Personal surrender and conduct or lifestyle or behavior. That's what? Inspired that's by that surrender. According to MacArthur, faith Includes your behavior, your conduct, your performance, your works. That is another gospel. Faith is simply belief. What is faith, people say? Faith is knowledge in assent. Knowledge, I have to have something to believe, so I need some knowledge. Christ died for my sins and offers me eternal life if I believe. Assent is, in my heart, I am convinced that it's what? True. True. I believe it. I trust it. I have the inward conviction that what God says about Christ and His Word is true. And now I am what? Saved. Do you get the picture? He that believeth on the Son of God is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. As many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His what? Name. He that believeth on me, Jesus says, hath everlasting what? Life. To him that worketh not, but believeth. On him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted as what? Righteousness. For man is not justified by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should what? Boast. What could be clearer? What could be clearer? Yet now we have wrongly dividing the word of truth. Now listen, I want you to know something. This is two different gospels. The church is divided today, and we're supposed to love our brethren. But listen, when it comes to something as important as this, you have to expose the heresy, the apostasy, and the lies, because the very truth of Christianity is at stake. And these men need to repent of their sin of preaching a false gospel and bringing the church into bondage of legalism. And it is denying the Lord... They think that they're the ones honoring the Lord, and in fact, they're the ones who are insulting the grace of God. MacArthur also says, the gospel says, give your life to Christ and let him rule it. Coming to Christ means giving up control of your life. No, it doesn't. That's discipleship. Salvation is what? Believe. Let me, let me, listen, they confuse discipleship with spiritual growth and sanctification. And that's the difference. MacArthur also says, salvation, listen to this one, is the result of a life lived in obedience 
in service to Christ. You wonder how a man could read the Bible, teach for so many years, at one point be used of God, and then preach this garbage. That's what it is. It's satanic. It is work salvation. Listen to what MacArthur says. And he's written three or four books on the subject. Hard to believe. The gospel according to Jesus. A few other ones. Salvation is the result of a life lived in obedience and service to Christ. It is the fruit of actions, not intentions. The life we live, not the words we speak, determines our eternal destiny. Totally wrong. None of that's right. It has nothing to do with the words we speak or the life we live. It's what we believe about Jesus that determines our eternal destiny. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned what? already and folks listen you will hear these men on the radio you will be exposed to them in your travels as you meet other Christians you need to know this right off the bat so that you will not fall from your own steadfastness the best defense against error is what knowledge of the truth Do you get the picture it's time to be big boys and girls and what stand up for God's truth faith alone in Christ alone MacArthur Piper Washer Ray Comfort Kirk Cameron, the Hollywood star, he's caught up in this. Remember him? He was with one of those stupid uh, sitcoms way back in the 80s or 90s. Ossie Sproul, David Platt, Driscoll, and on down the line. They're, they're, they're all what? Calvinists. Uh, they all believe in the tulip theology, and they preach this lordship salvation. MacArthur also said, listen to this, when you present the gospel... You are calling people to turn from their sin and follow what? Christ. No, you are not. You are not calling people to turn from your sin. You are calling people to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the, when the Bible uses the word repent, all that word repent means is metanoia in the Greek, a change of what? Mind. A change from unbelief to what? Belief. That's all it means. They have taken repent, which means simply a change of mind and turned it into the Catholic doctrine of penance. Meaning you have to do these things to prove you have faith. That is not the gospel, folks. Now I hope that you see this. We are saved by believing in Christ and in Him alone. We grow by surrendering our life, by obeying Him, by following Him by serving him will be rewarded for doing those things but those things have nothing to do with getting into what heaven and listen you know why it's so popular because religion is ingrained in human beings we're taught from a child do good and you'll be what blessed will god be happy with you little johnny if you do that will jesus be pleased you know we're, we're you know and we know what our parents are saying but we're being, we go to school, we're graded on our performance, right? You get that report card, right? You go to work at the job, you do good, you get a raise, you get evaluated, right? You do bad, you get a bad evaluation or a pink slip and says, see you later, right? Relationships with people. There's very few friends who love you and accept you unconditionally with all your what? Scars and warts and, 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 and issues, right? When you got people like that, you got a good friend, by the way. Okay, but there's not many that will love you like that, okay? <coughs> Listen, folks. We're, we're, it's ingrained in us that I am only accepted if I perform what? Well. And then we get saved into the Christian life and we start to carry that garbage and baggage. That's why we need our minds what? Renewed. Because God's ways are not what? Our ways. So we take that and we adopt religion after coming to Christ. And many Christians have fallen from the grace of God. What do you mean, Pastor? They're not lost. They got saved by grace, but they're doing what Paul said in Galatians 5. You know when he said, stand fast in the liberty where Christ made you free? Be not again entangled with the yoke of bondage. Try to do all these works to prove you're saved or be saved. Then he told them, beware lest you fall from grace. And he didn't mean lose your salvation. Falling from the grace in the Bible is falling away from living in the grace of God as your what? Lifestyle and means of growth. It means going from being under grace to back under what? legalism and works Do you understand and there are saved people who are saved and going to land in heaven who are miserable today frustrated and under the bondage of always trying to do enough to see if they are saved or to earn God's what acceptance 
they have fallen from the grace of God, even though they're saved. They've fallen from grace as a way of what? Life. As a way of what? Means of what? Growth. You understand now? You get in the picture? And they've been brought into what? Bondage. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And of course, this verse is taken out of context. Verse number 5, it says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now, if I just took that verse and didn't read what we read Wednesday night from 1 Corinthians 9, and didn't read the couple of verses that come before it, well, then I could build a case that says, well, this is their favorite verse. Look at your life. See if you're doing enough to prove you're really what? A Christian. See if you're not dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. If you're not living up to what? Their standard of what holiness is. Then guess what? You're not a Christian. You're a reprobate. But is that what Paul's really saying in that passage? On Wednesday evening, we looked at 1 Corinthians 9, 1 to 3. He says, you are examining what? Me and questioning if I am an apostle. Now look at verse 3. To the same people, he writes, defending his apostleship. And he says... Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, to which to you would is not weak, but is mighty in you. Okay? He says, the words that I spoke are mighty in you. Why? Because who led them to Christ? He did. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. I think I said Acts chapter 8 the other night, but I meant 18, okay? Acts 18, chapter 18, Acts 1 to 11. Paul goes to Corinth, stays there a year and a half, works with his hands, Leads them to Christ and then ministers to them and builds the what? Church up, right? For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? What Paul is saying is, don't you realize? You're looking for proof that Christ speaks through me. All right, look at yourselves. He asked them a question. Don't you know that Christ is in you? And what's their answer? Yeah, we're saved. We're Christians today. Well, Paul says, look, if you examine yourself and you know you're a Christian, you've believed in Christ, then that's the proof that he speaks through who? Me. Paul is not saying have, a, have gross introspection and look at your life and see if you're doing enough to prove you're a Christian. That is not what he's saying, folks. And this twisting of Scripture has led to all kinds of damage to people's lives. And they're constantly looking inward at themselves or at their life and their performance to see, oh, am I really a Christian? Am I doing enough? Oh, I sinned today. I had some bad thoughts. I did this. I did that. I slipped. I fell. Maybe I'm not really a Christian. Because I'm not, what, adding up today or the last few weeks or the last few months. You see, now we're going to talk. And it robs people of what? Assurance. The confidence that their sins are forgiven, that they are saved, that they belong to God, and that heaven is their home, and they are in the grace of God. Do you understand what we're talking about here? Now I want to give you some things about assurance. I'd like you to take me, I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. See, the great thing we read on Wednesday evening, we said, John said that he, he wrote his whole gospel about all the signs that Jesus did that you would know that you'd have eternal life. That through the things that are written, you'd believe in Jesus Christ. And then in 1 John, in chapter 5 and 13, he said, he wrote all the things he wrote so that you might know that you have what? Eternal life. See, God wants us as his children to know that we're saved, that we're forgiven, that heaven is our home. Do you get that? Can a child grow up healthy if they're always questioning, am I really your child, Dad? Do you really love me? Do you really accept me? Now, I know there's some parents who put their children under bondage. You shouldn't, but there are some parents that do. Always demanding, never showing them love, you know, making them question their, if they're accepted. But our Father in Heaven's not that way. He's a good Father, right? He wants us to know in our hearts completely and perfectly that I love you, I forgive you, I accept you, even though you have bumble and stumble and sin and fail all the time. But because you have believed in my Son, Jesus Christ, I now, by my grace, declare you righteous and acceptable to me forever. And He wants us to have assurance. Because you, how are you going to go forward in the Christian life and grow if you're not sure if you belong to God? Yeah. How can you trust God when problems come and trust His promises 
when testing comes and pain and suffering comes if you're not sure that he's what? Accepted you. You can't. You see? So assurance of salvation is like the first step of the Christian life. First believe in Christ and then have assurance. Because you can't grow and build a spiritual life unless you have that. If you're always wondering, where do I stand with God? Have I done enough? Does he accept me? Am I pleasing to him? Whew, that's misery. Can a child grow up healthy? Always wondering if they really belong in the family. Always wondering if, is that really my dad? Can a soldier go fight on the battlefield if he's not sure if he's a citizen of the country that sent him to fight? If we, send, if we got an army together in, in, in the United States and sent them to fight our enemies on foreign soils, which there aren't really many, uh, we, we've made up a lot of enemies, but anyways, another story for another time. We send them to fight. The soldier can only fight bravely and courageously if he has the confidence that that's my country. I'm a citizen of that what? Country. If the soldier's on the battlefield and going, what am I doing here? I don't even know. If I'm really a citizen, can they fight courageously? As Christians, we're called to be soldiers of the Lord, right? Warriors, fight spiritual battles. Can we do that courageously? If we're always doubting, am I really a citizen of heaven? See? You see the damage this can do to people? Okay. God wants us to be fully assured. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and he tells us so. Okay, he tells us so. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 10. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, By the which will we are sanctified, and that's positional sanctification, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for what? All. Christ died once for all. Never needs to be repeated. All right? Verse 11, And every priest standing daily, stand daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's why Roman Catholicism with the mass and the priesthood saying this is the what another offering of Christ is an abomination and heresy, okay, and pure paganism because there's only one sacrifice and they say they're offering Jesus. The priest is turning a wafer into Jesus' body and the, and the wine into Jesus' blood. That's black magic. That's voodoo. Okay, that doesn't happen. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Christ died once for what? All, verse 10. And it says, every priest that keeps offering sacrifices can never take away what? Sins. There's only one sacrifice can take away sins. The blood of Jesus. Keep reading. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered how many? One sacrifice for sins. For how long? Forever. Sat down at the right hand of who? God. I mean, he finished the work, right? And the Father accepted it. One sacrifice. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering of himself, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay? He has perfected us forever. Now look at verse 15. And then he made a new covenant with us. Through this one sacrifice, which dealt with sin once and for all and forever, the moment you believed in Jesus Christ, he could forgive you past sins, present sins, and future sins, and completely accept you forever because of Christ's sacrifice. Look at verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, that's the new birth, and their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember what? No more. Right? Forgiven. Perfectly. Completely. Verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering of sin. Since we have been perfectly forgiven, is there a need for another sacrifice? No. We got one sacrifice made 2,000 years ago was so perfect and so complete, never needs to be repeated. Right? And what do we do? We rest in that finished work. We rest by faith in the fact that Christ has paid for our sins and we are completely forgiven. Amen. That's our confidence. Not our performance, because look at verse 19. Now we've got access to God. And it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness. What's boldness? Confidence, right? Not doubt, not guilt, not fear, not apprehension, not misgiving, right? We have boldness to enter into the holiest by obedience, by surrender. By service, by sacrifice, by good deeds. 
By what? The blood. The blood of Jesus. How do I enter into God's presence and His acceptance into a relationship and fellowship with God? Does it have anything to do with my performance? Does it? What's the Bible say? Be, no, it says the blood. The blood's applied by faith. We know that. But right here it says the only thing that secures my access into this relationship and fellowship with God, which is permanent, is the blood of Christ. Now let me ask you a question. You've had a good day today. You witnessed to several people. You prayed. You felt close to the Lord. You went to church. You overcame temptation. You were nice to your dog and the kids and etc. You made a donation to some people who needed help. You did all sweet, wonderful, nice Christian things. You sang hymns all day. Are you accepted because of all that by God? No. By the what? Blood. Tomorrow, you wake up grouchy. You argue with the first person you see. You kick the dog. Right? You're full of anger and frustration. Evil thoughts enter your mind. Maybe you actually act on some of them. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. You don't feel like talking to anybody about Jesus. Leave me alone. You're just miserable wretch. But you believed in Christ 15 years ago as your Savior. Two years ago, one years ago, five years ago, six months ago, last week. You believed and you were declared what? Righteous and justified. You're still accepted by God. Why? By the what? Blood. It never depended on your performance. And arrogant, self-righteous, religious jerks, okay? Apostate Pharisees can't get that through their holier-than-thou, self-righteous, elitist minds that cannot comprehend the grace of God. That has nothing to do with my performance. And yet the Bible is crystal clear when it's rightly what? Divided. Now let me tell you, there's some, this, and God loves to throw some verses in there that if you take out of context, you'll stumble right over them and break your spiritual neck. And he leaves them in there for the arrogant fools. You see, how do, what's one of the things that is imp imperative that we have if we want to understand Scripture and rightly divide it? Patience. Yeah, big one. Somebody said humility. Humility, patience, right? Seek it earnestly, right? A desire to what? Learn. So guess what? When you have pride, religious pride, are you patient and humble and seeking the... Oh, you know it all, Right? And what happens? God will put verses in the Bible that the self-righteous and the arrogant and the proud will stumble over and twist or rest to their own what? Destruction. And why does God do it? With the intent that hopefully they'll get miserable enough that they'll humble themselves to really learn my what? Truth. You get in the picture? What happens most of the time is they just keep getting more harder and harder and self-righteous and they become what? Blind to the truth. Then they become Pharisees. Okay? Now, folks, let's look at assurance. I'd like, if you would, I'd like you to turn me just quickly to Ephesians chapter 2 and I want to give you a definition. Grace. Got to understand it. Grace is God's free, unmerited favor. It's a gift given with no claim or expectation of return finding its motive 
in the bounty and, that means and right there, free heartedness of the giver. Who is who? God, right? Now listen, grace, simple. Don't forget it. This is the definition. In the Greek, charis means God's free, unmerited favor. Unmerited means this. God does not give you grace because He sees something in you that deserves it. It's unmerited. God doesn't look and say, Oh, my, you're so sweet and nice. I must give you this gift. No, He looks at all of us and He says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. All your righteousness is filthy, what rags. We're all sinners, guilty before God. He can't find anything in us deserving of giving us grace. You get the picture? He gives it because of his own what? What's his motive? The bounty and the free heartedness of the giver. Because of his own heart of love, he chooses to do this for his what? Creatures. It's not something in us that he sees that causes him to give grace. It's something in his what? Self, in his own character, his own heart of great love th that would cause him to send his son to suffer that agony for a sinner like me and you, okay? And then it says it's a gift, which means it's what? Free. You don't earn it. Given with no claim or expectation of what? Return. What's that mean? Grace is not God saying, I'll give you this, you give me something what? Back. That would not be what? Grace. Grace is one way. God gives, we receive it by faith. You say, well, isn't faith, faith meritorious? No. Faith is not meritorious. Faith is not a work. All faith is the empty hand what? Accepting the gift. That's why the Bible says, therefore it is by faith that it might be by what? Grace. Because the only thing compatible with grace is what? Faith. If it's of works, then it's no longer of grace, the scripture says. Right? If by, if by works, then grace is no longer grace. Romans eleven six. The moment you add one work, whatever it is, you nullify grace. So now, who's got all the merit? Not us. Christ. Right? Now think about it. God gives this gift no strings attached. It's not what's being preached today. Listen. Now, is this a free grace gospel? Follow Christ and be saved. Is that a free grace gospel? You better say no after all the preaching I've done. Or else I'm just preaching to stones here. Stumps. You've got to be dumb as a stump if you can't figure that out, right? After everything I just said. Forsake your sin and turn to the Lord and be saved. Is that the gospel? Count the cost to be saved. Is that the gospel? Surrender your life to Jesus and be saved. Is that the gospel? Put Christ on the throne and make Him Lord. Is that the gospel? Obey Jesus and be saved. Is that the gospel? No. And it's a funny thing. They'll, they'll take a verse like that says, Them that obey not the gospel... And they say, see, you've got to obey it. You've got you to obey. No, that's a, called a synonym. Okay, context. I'll give you a verse. Let me show you a verse that brings us all. Go to John chapter 3. We'll come back to Ephesians in a second. John chapter 3. I want you to show you something. Look at John chapter 3, look at verse 35 and 36. John the Baptist speaking about Jesus. Uh, da, 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 da. That's not the verse I wanted, but let's read it anyway. It says, verse 35, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there you have it simply set out that believing brings what? Eternal life, unbelief, wrath, right? I'll get the verse for you. I'm not sure. I thought it was right there, but I was mistaken. But there's a verse in John that says, He that believeth, 
hath everlasting life, and those that obey not the gospel shall not see life. Now, right there in that one verse, it tells you what obey means. The context is what? Faith in Christ. To, to fail to obey the gospel means to fail to believe in who? Christ. To fail to obey is just another synonym for unbelief. Okay? Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. And of course, they'll use that to trip people what? Up. Okay? Because you have to understand how words are used. Remember I told you, don't get caught in illegitimate totality transfer. You say, what the heck is that? Illegitimate totality transfer is assuming that because a word means one thing in this place, that it means the same thing in every place. No. What determines how a word is used in its meaning? Context. Okay? Um, I'll get that verse for you next class. I, don't, I made the... Uh, I'm not quite sure there. All right, Ephesians. I'll get it. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you something. Now look here. Grace. So grace is not you giving God something back. It's God giving something to you that is absolutely free. Uh, Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by His grace. That is in what? Christ Jesus. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life. What? Freely. Over and over again, we're told that the offer of gospel is what? Free. It's not a bargain. It's not... As these preachers, MacArthur and Piper and Chan and Washer, are saying, you give God something, uh, he'll give you something back, right? God gives you something, you give him something back. That's not the gospel. That's not free. That's not grace. Uh, for, for verse 8, Ephesians 2, for by what? Grace, charis, i.e. what? Saved. Through what? Faith. Notice, not what? For faith. It's not how much your faith you have. It's not the quality of your faith that counts. Do you understand that? It's through what? Faith. There's a lot of people say, well, uh, you know, you don't, they redefine faith. You don't have real faith. You have intellectual faith, not, uh, not hot faith. Listen, man believes in his what? Hot. In his what? Mind. Intellectual faith is hot faith, folks. Okay? The, the, the Bible knows no distinction between head faith and hot faith. It knows only the distinction between belief and unbelief. Do you understand? And now here's the thing. He said, by grace are you saved through faith. Not for faith. Are you listening? Not for faith. It's not how much faith you have that counts. It's not the quality of your faith that counts. It's who you put your little bit of faith, what? In. The merit belongs to who? Christ. Not you. You're saved through faith. And it says, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? Gift of God. It's not by anything you do. I mean, come on, folks. What could be simpler? Not of what? Works. Lest any man should boast. You see that faith is the exact antithesis of works? Antithesis means it's the exact what? Opposite. Right? They don't go together. So we're told that we're saved by God's free, unmerited favor, no claim or expectation in return. Now God in giving us grace, His, His desire is that we would what? Understand how good He is, realize His love, and by mature understanding and growth and love in return we would serve him but he doesn't require it to be saved do you understand that of course he wants us to serve him of course he wants us to obey him of course he wants us to follow him and, and grow so we can sacrifice and be rewarded and you know live a life that honors him absolutely but that's not a requirement for what salvation that's part of our spiritual growth and that's part of our reward, but that has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is free, absolutely free. Zane Hodges wrote a book years ago. You can still pick it up. He, he's passed on. Um, he's a fellow that I agree a lot with. I don't agree with everything he's, he's taught, but I'll tell you what, when it comes to this understanding of grace, he wrote a book called Absolutely Free. Pick up a copy. You can go online, pick it up on Amazon. Instead of watching American Idol or the ball game, do yourself some good theological reading. Get your Bible out, get absolutely free, and read it. And get what? Confirmed and rooted and grounded and built up in what? The grace of God. If this is causing a problem for you. If not, you know, maybe you just want to do it just to 
learn some more stuff about God, which will be edifying. It will be edifying. But God's grace is absolutely free, folks. Do you understand that? No strings attached. Jesus said, who the Son sets free is free what? Indeed. And we are not under the law, but under what? Grace. What a wonderful life God has prepared for us. And he wants us to be fully assured that we're his children. Now let me show you something. So salvation is by grace. Once you understand that it's a free gift, there's only one condition. Let me write this down for as we close. We've got about seven, eight minutes. Here's assurance. Assurance of salvation. Simple. It's based on three things. One, Understand what grace is. You got that? Once you understand what grace is, a gift that you cannot earn, that is absolutely free, no strings attached, okay? Then number two is this. Understand, I'm just going to go like that, means understand, right? The one condition of salvation in the scripture what's the one condition of salvation faith in what Christ and a synonym for faith would be what believe right another synonym would be what trust okay another synonym would be obey the gospel okay you get in the picture the Bible also says drink Right? Eat. You get the picture? These are all synonyms for one thing. Faith. What's the one condition of salvation? Faith alone in Christ alone. Right? 115 passages. We looked at a bunch of them the other night. Tell us very clearly that salvation is by faith alone. To him that worketh not. Romans 4, 4 and 5. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted as what? Righteousness. And then finally, go with me, if you will, to John chapter 6, and I'll give you some verses. I'm gonna put, everybody got this? Can I zip it off? Okay. We're going to go over this again. Don't worry. And number three, very simple. Take God who cannot lie at his word. Good John's gospel. Everybody there? Chapter 6. Did I say John chapter 6, folks? Okay, I want to give you something here. Now listen. I'll give you some verses. Psalm 138. Don't turn there for the sake of time. Verse 2 in Numbers 23, 19. Psalm 138, 2 says that the Lord magnifies His word above His name. The name of God represents the character of God, right? All His attributes. God's character is in perfect harmony. All right? Everything he does is always in perfect harmony with his whole character. He never sacrifices any of his attributes for another attribute. Okay? And he says he puts his word above his name. Why? Because he has to. If God breaks his word, his name is no what? Good. His character has been what? Defiled. Right? Compromised. Right? So when God gives you his word, you realize that his whole character is backing up that word. And when God makes you a promise, he has to keep it because his character is on the line. That's why he put it in writing. Right? You understand? And then in Numbers 23, 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Or what? Changes what? Mind, you see? I am the Lord, I change not. Repent doesn't mean penance. It means the change of what? Mind. I am the Lord, I change not. Hath he not said, and shall he not what? Do it. Hath he not spoken it, and shall he not bring it to what? Pass. Those are questions that are called rhetorical questions, meaning there's only one what? Answer. Of course, he's God. That's the answer, right? So God is all veracity. Veracity is one of his attributes of his character. And he's immutable. He doesn't change. Oh, thank God. That's how I... And he's also omnipotent. He, he can't lie. 
He doesn't change his mind. And he's all powerful. That tells me when he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. And he's powerful enough to make sure that whatever he promises is going to happen. And when he says, John Ritchie, you old scoundrel, if you believe in my son, you're going to land in heaven. I can rest assured that I can take him at his word. You get it? Just that simple. Assurance. We've lost the simplicity of the gospel. These people are being told today, oh no, the promise is not enough. You've got to live a life that what? Lines up. That's MacArthur. That's Piper. That's Washer. That's hypercalvinism. The problem is they sniff too many tulips. You know that tulip theology? They're a bunch of tulip sniffers. They're so stuck in tulip, they can't understand the what? Bible. When you get your nose stuck in some man's philosophy of religion like Calvin, God closes what? The book. So go around sniffing Calvin's tulips, you won't know what the Bible says. And that's why they're all messed up. And we've lost the simplicity of the gospel today. The simplicity. God has made a promise. Not just, he's made literally thousands. On salvation, you can find hundreds of verses in the New Testament that are promises of salvation to those who simply what? Believe. What more do I as a human being need to have assurance? Nothing. He's told me it's by grace, it's a gift, and I can't earn it. He told me the only condition is believe. I now have believed it. What is the next thing? Take God who cannot lie and doesn't change and is all powerful at his word. Period. Salvation's by grace. There's only one condition, believe. And now, to complete that assurance, take God at his word. God made you a promise. He cannot go back on it. Just go to the book. Look what Jesus said, John chapter 6. Look at this, verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast what? Out. Jesus said, now how do you come to Jesus? Now coming to Jesus is another synonym for what? Believing, right? How do you come to Christ? By believing. He says, and if you come, you believe, he will not what? Throw you what? Out. To keep reading though. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that what? Sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him, because we haven't seen him, but we believe what? Upon him, right? May have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. God Almighty has promised that if we believe in his Son, he'll never what? Cast us out. He will what? Give us eternal life, and he will resurrect us on the last day. Do you understand that? Look at John chapter 6, look at verse 47. Verily, verily. Notice whenever it says verily, verily. Verily, verily means truly, truly. Everything Jesus says is true. But if he says verily, verily, he's saying, pay attention, take notice, right? This is important. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth, and notice it says on me in your King James, because a lot of your modern versions leave out on me. Okay? And it just says believeth. Well, just believing that there is a God ain't going to get you to heaven because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but through what? Me. Just believing there's a God don't get you to heaven. You know, um, uh, Muslims believe there's a God. There's one God, but they ain't going to heaven because they're trusting Muhammad in the Quran, not Jesus in the blood. Are you with me? But notice what it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You believe on me, you have everlasting life. The moment you believe, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The apostle Paul was asked by the jailer in Philippi. And he answered, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Period. Faith alone in Christ alone. So how do I have assurance? Not by looking at me and examining what? Myself. That's pitiful. No matter how good I live, I fall what? Short. But I know the blood has been shed. 
that my access to God is what? Purchased by the blood. And he said, it's a gift of grace. You can't earn it. There's only one condition, believe. And my character backs it up. So take me at my what? Word. God's made a promise. You believed it. You're saved. And you thank him for it. And don't let anybody try to rob you of that assurance. Now, what should you do after that? Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll even get what? Stronger in your faith and your understanding. Are you with me? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, tonight we're grateful and we're thankful that we've had the time to study and note these very important truths from your word. And I pray, Father, that in this day of apostasy and confusion, where the gospel is being compromised and substituted with another gospel and another Jesus, I pray, Lord, that we would stand firm upon the true foundation of faith alone in Christ alone and the gospel of the grace of God. And, Lord, I pray that you give us discernment to see through the errors the deceptions and the doctrines of devils that are infiltrating the church in these last days. Lord, and I pray that you'd use us to proclaim this wonderful message of God's grace through the promises and the cross of Jesus Christ. Dedicate the last moment of the service tonight to anyone here if you're not saved. The Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right now, in the privacy of your own heart and mind, you can tell God, I know that I'm a sinner. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you. You alone as my Savior, my Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. We'll take a moment of silence for anyone who wishes to trust Christ. Now, Father, tonight, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart, Lord, and if they have believed in the Lord Jesus during this service, my prayer is that you would give them assurance in their heart that you've saved them and forgiven them. I pray that you would reveal your great love to them in a special way. And I ask, Father, that you lead them back, that they might continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we depart tonight, Lord, I pray that you take the written word and make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. And I ask these things in his name. Amen.